I'm Davion. I'm your host for Business Battery Pack. Um, a little while ago, we had a special episode on Live from Hollywood TV with Franco and Lacey K. Uh, they had the esteemed, the illustrious DJ Payne one, and he came on and he talked about how to get into the, the music industry, what his background is in making in making hits for some hit artists, um, and the response was so overwhelming, we had to get him back, and I had to get him over here on the business battery pack. So we're going to talk a little bit of music business today, and uh, I just want to introduce DJ Payne One. What's up, Payne One? What's up, good? Uh, it's afternoon. Yeah, it's afternoon. Good, good. Yeah, yeah, it's afternoon where I'm at. Um, yeah, I appreciate you coming on, man, you know, and uh, I know you're a busy guy, so I really ex appreciate you coming in twice, you know. Oh, yeah. Cool, cool. So I'm gonna jump right into it. Uh, we got some people uh, on the on the line here, and I've got people on Twitter. You guys hit us up and ask questions uh, at DJ Payne One and at Biz Battery Pack. Uh, we'll answer as many of the questions that you have. Um, I'm gonna start the interview off. Um, here's what I want to know, Payne. Uh, I'm gonna try not to cover all the stuff that you know you guys covered in the last interview. People can go and check that out. Um, but what have you been up to lately? I know you just released uh, your Loops and Sample series. Uh, you care to talk about that? Um, I'm always releasing something, so okay. Just kind of, it's an ongoing thing. I, I try to stay as consistent as possible, and I mean, space them out. But mm -hmm. the most recent one that I released was what the uh... oh, it was it was to commemorate 10,000 likes on Facebook. That's what it was. Okay. So cool. For everybody who liked me on Facebook, they they got one. I didn't release it on any other website or any other media outlet. So that was that was strictly for the um, people who supported me. For Facebook. Only my Facebook, because I'm a late bloomer as far as Facebook is concerned. I got my Facebook page like a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. You know, so when I hit ten thousand, that was a cool benchmark. I just wanted to give something back. Do you feel like um, that kind of interaction, uh, particularly giving back to people that have supported you? And um, offering things exclusively through, you know, a limited availability on one site in particular. Do you feel like that's something that was beneficial? Yeah, I mean that's probably been the most beneficial um, uh, technique that I've used to, to promote. In the sense that it doesn't even appear to be a promotional technique. You know what I mean? And that's what I always tell artists um, in the world of social media. You have to make your social media outlets appealing you know no no one wants to be, like the reason people visit websites is not because they care about what the webmaster is doing they they go there because they enjoy the content and so if you're not um, if the content of your site isn't appealing you know what I'm saying if world star didn't have a new video of like little kids fighting every day no one would go um, because people like to see little kids fighting and all types of other degrading stuff but if, <laughs> um, if, if, if you're an upcoming artist and you don't have thousands of devoted fans then every day you're posting the same link to the same mixtape no one wants to see that because they've already seen it they, they want something that um, is going to enhance their lives and their experiences and you gotta you know make it a, a, a two-way exchange so that's kind of what I started doing especially with with production um, I mean with, with with just being a recording artist it's a little different but the concept is the same you gotta give the people something in order for them to support you and in order for them to come to your social media page you know just just my thing was I started doing it by accident because I was teaching and so I just started putting out tutorial videos and then I realized people um, we're gravitating towards it, so I just expanded it into other um, exclusive content. I just became a content creator, and that was complementary to my um, career as a producer and DJ. Because you know the people that support me, because I give them something, are going to support me when I have a, a musical project out. They're going to go and download it, and then that's that's to me that's a true fan. Because then we actually have some type of connection beyond them just listening to my music. Let me ask you this, um, because you said a lot of things that, that were good jumping off points. Um, there seems to be, a, there seems to be an old, I don't know if it's an old school mentality, but an artist in general, you know, like you said, used to be, hey, I just make my songs, 
I promote myself. It's about me, 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 me. Listen to me. Check me out. Right. Yeah. Um, what you said was very important because you talk about basically you sort of have to become a, a one person content generating machine. And so it has to be multiple different types of content. It's not just music. Yeah. And it's also give and take. Do you feel like do you feel like I guess mentally for some, you know, especially up and coming or especially established artists, do you feel like it's a hard adjustment? You know, because I think an artist is used to everything just being about people coming to them. And the way they consider giving back is, hey, if I do a show, you get that. If I put out a song, you get that. That is your reward. What, what kind of a, a mental process has to change, or what do you think needs to happen for more people to figure that out and understand that? The, the mental process that has to change is acceptance of reality, honestly. Mm -hmm. Because when you look around, there's not a single artist, up-and-coming artist out um, that has a huge Internet following. I'm talking about pre-major. Um, there's not a single artist who's not constantly giving his or her fans a piece of themselves all the time, constantly. Um, I mean, it, it, and in addition is it, to that, is there's not an artist out just not who's finding that kind of success in an independent or unsigned market um, who's not doing something innovative and different. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, and it can be as simple as something like what Macklemore is doing and writing music that mm -hmm. is just so topically different than what we traditionally associate with hip hop or pop music. You know, no no rapper up until no straight rapper, at least up until mm -hmm. Macklemore, as far as I know, made a song about gay marriage or mm -hmm. the fact that he has a pop hit that's gone like seven times platinum about buying his stained <laughs> clothing. Right, you know what right, I mean? right. It's just different, and a lot of people wouldn't do that because it's too much of a risk stylistically and in terms of their identity as rappers and whatnot. You know, that's all that's all trash. But I think just just starting with doing something different and unique that that's gonna that's gonna um that's gonna spill over into your merchandising and your marketing because you know, and that's the other necessary um, element in, in my opinion. Just just finding a unique way to reach people. Make making your shows memorable, making your social media appealing, um, just really standing out in general. So, you, you know, like I said, it's it's a matter of accepting reality and looking around and seeing that all of these other artists all have their own unique edge. Whether it's the way they market, whether it's the way they look, whether it's the content of the music, whether it's their production, you know, they all have something. The successful ones, at least, all have some unique edge. Mm -hmm. So it's about finding that unique edge, you know. And I feel like I've kind of found that niche as a content creator, as a part of the um, the the international community of producers. Mm -hmm. um, so just I'm in kind of the refining stages and and seeing what really works and and seeing how I can take it, however many steps further I'm able. I, w I wanted to ask you that because you, um, you know, a lot of what you're saying goes into, you know, branding yourself and, and like you said, sort of packaging yourself. What I want to know is you kind of said earlier, you, you kind of, you found it out maybe by accident, but did you intentionally go in and say, hey, I'm going to find some communities that like what I do and I'm going to try to establish myself within a, a smaller group and then expand or did you say, hey, I'm going to go as wide as I can? Uh, I didn't. I didn't think either. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the reason I even got on YouTube and started putting videos was, and 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 right now YouTube is my base. That's that's kind of the, the center of my social media universe, and everything else is just branching out from there. Okay. Um, Twitter, not yeah, Twitter too. Twitter is kind of, I mean, I'll, well, let me explain it. Um, I put out a tutorial video on how to use. Sony Acid Pro to produce music, just some real basic stuff because I was teaching high schoolers at the time, mm -hmm. and, I, and and we were a, a technology academy, so they all had free internet access at home because of, it was this um it was this pre college program kind of like an outreach thing, mm -hmm. and uh, I was I was at the university here, so they could access that material at home, and I just wanted them to look at it during the weekends during our production unit so that they didn't 
forget what to do. Right. So they need to refresh it, they could access it. But the thing about YouTube is it's public. So everybody is searching and anyone who had any curiosities about how to use the program stumbled on my videos. And at the time I was the only one making those kinds of videos. So it started getting a couple thousand and tens of thousands and, and so on. And, and my numbers aren't astronomical, but I'm like at the 1.5 million mark. So it's a small enough community. And, and, and then I decided to just expand from there and, and figure, well, if there's a content, or I'm sorry, if there's a market for this type of content, then it stands to reason that if I start releasing other free content that producers can use, mm -hmm. then that's going to attract more people to what I'm doing. And so I tried with um, the free loops and samples, and then I said, okay, cool, well, what's the next logical step from there? Well, let's see. Um, a lot of people have questions about um, you know, business and, and conducting oneself professionally, and so I started doing the, uh, the, the promoting your music online video series, and that was successful, and then I decided that I wanted to put something else that was more general out, so I did the Paintspective thing with like different topics here and there. The last one I did was copyright. Mm -hmm. um, I so saw I, that. I, I just saw that you put that out like a few weeks ago, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. So just you know, s stuff that I think I would have appreciated when I was um, just kind of starting with with uh, production and, and trying to become a professional. Just advice from someone else that's doing it, you know, because I didn't really have that. Mm -hmm. so I try to put myself in, in the shoes of the viewers, and 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 then also, you know, people ask questions all the time. So if I get Ask the same question a bunch of times. I figure I should address it at some point. And copyright was one of those things. So, so for people that are going to watch this, that are watching this now, I want to, I want to kind of get it clear and sum it up. And correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, what you did was, you were already sort of educating people and showing people, you know, what you do in production, and you put together some content that was useful to that audience. And that was independent of you being a commercial producer, yeah. right? Being a producer, but in in building the content that was helpful for the people that needed it, there was some overlap where they discovered, hey, you know, he also is a producer, and then you use that sort of as a base to build from. Is that correct? Well, it's kind of back and forth, back and forth, because okay. if cool. if people weren't already aware of the the work I was doing professionally. It would make my advice a little less um, legitimate, right? At Authority least from, wise, from their perspective, right, yeah. Right, because right, then, right. No, I mean, perception is everything. It so is. People perceive me as a as a producer who's worked with all these major artists and gone on tour and blah blah blah. Then they're they're more likely to to, to look towards me for that kind of advice and see me as an authority figure. Wh whether or not I'm any more equipped to do that and play that role than anyone any any other producer in the industry. You know, that's another question. But the fact of the matter is, there was a, a void, mm -hmm. you know. And, and my thing was, you know, and, and I had some apprehensions, as a lot of people do, because everything's so competitive. You don't want to give away trade secrets or whatever and right. explain exactly what to do. And my thing was like, look, I'm either going to be successful or I'm not. Mm -hmm. And that's going to have nothing to do with what, what the, the secrets and the techniques I reveal. So I may as well just give it all. I may as well just be an open book. How long, how long, what was your process like and how long was it before you decided, all right, I'm just going to jump over here and do it, you know, because like you said, there was some apprehension. So, yes. you know, was it sort of a, all right, let's just do it or was it sort of a, let's put some out and see what happens? No, I just, I said, let's just do it because mm -hmm. it was already, it was already in motion and, and I couldn't go around and, and preach consistency mm -hmm. without actually living it myself because that right. would just be hypocritical and that I, I couldn't. I couldn't uh, stand right. that way, so I just I said, you know what, I'm just going to do it. This The same way I tell artists, put the music out, put yourself out there, mm -hmm. release that content, you know, information wants to be free as well. So right. I, I mean, it, and there's no doubt that, you know, the stuff you're putting out is valuable. You know, like I said, I, I watch your videos, and, you know, it's not just talk. It's, it's stuff that comes from a real place and some real understanding. Uh, one of the questions, or one of the issues I sort of see is that, Sometimes people can get sucked into the internet and they become, they only consume the internet and mm -hmm. then they don't actually go out and do stuff. So yeah. what I wonder is, you know, aside from maybe, you know, the students you might teach directly, um, 
do you get a sense that people that watch your stuff, they're actually trying to put some of that stuff in practice? And do you get any success stories? Yeah, absolutely. Matter of fact, um, I got an email from somebody by the name of Shutdown Beats a couple of months ago. Okay. And uh, he produced a big, big, big record for Red Cafe called Gucci Everything. Um, oh, cool. And it was this, the remix had Fab on it, Chief Keef. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say French Montana, but mm -hmm. that might just be because he's on every remix now. He is on every remix. I'm not going to assume he was on it, but it was a crazy remix. Yeah. He sent me the text or, or the email. and No, actually, uh, it was a comment on the YouTube video. He, he said, I followed your technique, and I got this placement. I mean, he actually said wow. that. Yeah. So, of course, and I'm, I'm sure he's not the only one. He's just yeah. one of the first people to say it. Yeah, and it's crazy. I'm familiar with that song because I I've yeah. got it on the mixtapes. Yeah, know, so big record. Yeah. The other the other person is you know that Drake started from the bottom record. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't even realize it. And this is what I'm talking about. There must be other people doing it that just mm -hmm. I, I don't know about. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean I'd appreciate it if they let me know because that gives yeah, me motivation yeah. to keep yeah, going. Yeah. But um, I was we had a conversation on Twitter because of I got into an argument with someone about spamming and he was like no but Mike Zombie did it and it worked for him so anyway <laughs> um, amidst the whole conversation Mike Zombie was like oh yeah yeah I used to watch your videos on YouTube they really helped wow okay so that I'm like well you're way bigger than I am right now that's right. <laughs> that's right. when it gets frustrating you're like damn I'm right. getting... but it's cool though it's a cool feeling just to know yeah. that you know what what I put out is actually helping people yeah it would be cool if those guys could give you some testimonials, you know, like, hey, you yeah. know, I listened to Pain One and look at what happened with me, you know? Yeah, I should start asking for that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, no doubt. Um, let me ask this, um, because I, I, I kind of got, a, I got a, a few other questions lined up. I want to kind of keep it in a direction. But, um, you know, with all the work you do, um, it takes a lot. How do you balance your creative side and always coming up with music? versus the business and all of the tasks you got to take care of? Like, do you have a team or, you know, is it just you? Uh, both. I mean, okay. the majority of what I do is self-directed. Um, I just have what I call late onset ADHD. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Self-diagnosed. I'm just making this term up. But... <laughs> I used to not be like this. Right. And now that, like I said earlier, off off uh, off off the record, mm -hmm. when um, you and I were talking, I have one computer on over there, mm -hmm. one on there, and then one here. <laughs> Stuff is happening at once, so I just kind of do everything at once. I think the the one saving grace is that I don't, I never did drugs, mm -hmm. so my memory is pretty good. Oh wow! Pretty good, but I, <laughs> I I mess up a lot of things. Like I've I've lost my um my my laptop stand literally six times. Wow! It, you know when I go out to DJ, so yeah, you know it's it's the balance is there, but it's not perfect. Yeah. So so, but you do have some assistance, but you know how how if if you were to give a percentage, right, of percentage of time you spend making music versus time you spend, you know, handling your business. Uh what would you what would you give from one to the other? Uh it's hard to say because everything is connected now. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. Is there some is there some point you have to just shut off and say, look, I'm going in the lab, I'm oh, yeah. going to make beats. I mean if there's something specific that I have to to accomplish, if there's a deadline, you mm -hmm. know I, I go on tour on Monday. And then on okay. Saturday we have a um, a producer battle. Okay. And, uh, you know, I uh, we're bringing Ivan out, who's who's handling my, um, my my shopping right now. Okay. From uh, from one shop management. So mm -hmm. I wanted to I, two two things I had to get done before then. I have uh, to finish the Coast to Coast volume. I forget the one hosted by Chiali that I'm mixing. Mm -hmm. um, I had to finish that. Before I went on tour with Coast to Coast, because that would be ridiculous if I showed up on the tour. I was like, yeah, I didn't get that stuff done. Right. So, and then also I had to get all the beats that I wanted to send to Ivan done before he comes out here. Right. So I'm working on the latter task and the Coast to Coast mixtape I finished last night finally, because I just knew I had to get it done. Right. Before a certain point. So the, the, the thing that bothers me about 
being a self-employed producer is that it, it, I'm at the point in my career where things are just kind of out in the open, you know, mm -hmm. or, or up in the air, rather. Um, I'm just making beats and working with, with my songwriter and sending them out and hoping that, you know, something works. But mm -hmm. I'd rather it be more focused. Right. You know, but otherwise it's just kind of up in the air, so I handle everything as it comes in. Right. I, I want to take a um I want to take a break to ask anybody in the audience if they have questions. Uh, I see my some of my my buddies have checked in. Uh, you got a question? Uh, say your name and give it to us. I guess nobody wants to say anything. All right, so um I'm gonna keep it rolling. Uh, switching up a little bit. I want to um what I want to know is uh. I, I, like you said, you you had had something about Twitter. Um, you kind of have some back and forth with people on there. I want to know um, what you said in the live from Hollywood interview was you talked about the internet removing the human element and creating a less helpful environment. And I wanted to know if you can talk a little bit more about that and you know how you deal with that because apparently you get bombarded with people asking you for favors and help and all of that stuff all day, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I'm the only one. I, I, it's it's pretty indiscriminate, and that's that's what I mean. I mean, if if um, the new norm within independent um, music is to just indiscriminately throw spaghetti at a wall, <laughs> then there is no human element involved in that. Right. You know, if you if you just because the the way I see it is, first of all, people tend to think that the internet is full of robots or something, or just because mm -hmm. it's anonymous, so you never know who you're talking to, or there's no face to it. There's no you can't look somebody in the eyes and and say something stupid to them, and mm -hmm. you know, so you people just kind of go crazy, mm -hmm. um, and I think it just psychologically messes people up because they see a Twitter name or they see a Facebook page and they don't realize that there are actual human beings behind that that you have to treat as actual human beings. Actual human beings with lives, with busy schedules, people who um, whose support and respect you really have to earn. And mm -hmm. the problem is people's perception, artists, a lot of artists' perception of the music industry is what they see and what they see are the end results. They don't see the work that goes into everything. Mm -hmm. Successful artists are successful because of relationships. Mm -hmm. Period. You know, they have relationships with either the right people or they just have good relationships with everybody. And some of those people end up becoming the right people. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're on the internet, you just you, you look at what other people are doing. And you're like, okay, two chains is hot right now. You don't realize that he had a really good. And I had a conversation with with, with I twenty about this last night. You don't realize all of the relationships he had with DJs to get to that point. Right, right. So people just, rather than earn support, they expect support. Right. So they might say, they might look at my page and say, okay, cool, he's a DJ, he, he'll support my record, because right. that's what DJs do. Hey, I'm, I'm going to tweet him my link. I'm also going to tweet DJ Drama and DJ Spins and DJ Techniques mm -hmm. and DJs, uh, Small as the link too at the same time, and I'm gonna throw Barack Obama in there too. Why not? <laughs> and this is real stuff. I can't make this stuff yeah, up. Yeah. Well, I got a link that's at DJ Drama at Barack Obama at yeah. DJ Smalls at DJ Pain One, and it's just a Reverb Nation link. Mm -hmm. It's like, what am what I'm? No, and I get twelve of these in a row. Right. I'm, I'm not touching that. It can get annoying. Uh, so, this is a two direction question. Um, it seems like. At best, with the internet, if it if it's not about building relationships, it's maybe somewhat tra a transactional relationship, a give and take, right? So you know, hey, if I if I give you some value, then maybe you'll give some value in return, right? Um, where would someone new just starting out and they're using the internet as their main tool? Where would they start? creating those kinds of relationships 
And what is one of your best tips for creating or at least starting a good relationship with someone that you don't know and you haven't approached yet? I think it comes from two different prerequisites, and one would be um, setting goals, mm -hmm. and two would be um, being aware of one's position mm -hmm. and, and being realistic. Because a lot of artists don't have goals, and you'll ask somebody, you know, s some artists will say, I've been doing this for five years, I'm ready. For what? What are your goals? What, what do you, what, what you want to happen next? Success. That's not a goal, that's just a word. Mm -hmm. What are your actual goals? In the next year, where do you want to be? Do you want to have a tour? Do you want, um, do you want to be self-distributed and... and Oh, my webcam is moving all over the place. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, and, and specifically, is the tour regional? You, you know, you just got to set the goals, and a lot of people won't even do that work. So they can't envision the, the their career trajectory so that in the meantime, they're still throwing spaghetti at the wall, and that's not going to help anybody. It, you know, if, if your goal is to release an album you better come up with a next step you know and and you better figure out exactly how you're gonna reach that goal but a lot of people don't even have goals. I, I think when you have goals in mind you can just map out your entire career not to say it's never gonna change mm -hmm. but a goal is gonna help you become more consistent it's gonna help you gauge whether or not you're accomplishing those goals if you're right. moving closer to those benchmarks then you know right. you're doing the right thing and if you're not um, then you you better you can evaluate it a lot more easily because right. you can see it it's on it's on paper it's it's written down you can physically hold a sheet of paper in your hand with your goals written down and you can say have I done what I was supposed to yet right. what do I still need to do let me fill in the blanks number two being realistic about your position um, is something that's also important because a lot of people might set unrealistic goals based on their abilities and based on their um, seniority as an artist mm -hmm. you know it, it, it's 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 not like you know some people just come out and they feel like they can ask for a thousand dollars a beat from a local artist or they can just come out and say no I'm not gonna do that local show I wanna be on tour with uh, you know Kanye West it's not gonna happen like that you <laughs> really have to, um, and, and I think that's where the the Twitter stuff comes from the the indiscriminate poor marketing comes from mm -hmm. where you know, let me send this to every DJ on Twitter. No, you find a DJ from your area that you can create a real relationship with. Because mm -hmm. then they're going to support. No one wants to support you if you don't know them, or if they and if they don't know you. And no one wants to support you if you've never supported them. Period. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I don't care how hot your record is. It's just not going to happen. That's not what it's about. We're all people. We we. The, the reason people win is because. There are a lot of supportive people, fans, DJs, label execs, marketing reps who want to see that person win. And they want to see them win partially because of their talent, but mostly because they respect that person and they respect who they are. And so in order to, to uh, find that level of respect, you have to earn it. Right, right. Um, I think uh, also, you know, what you said about goals... I think a lot of people either feel like it's too overwhelming yeah. or something that, that's not necessary for them. Like, I don't need to do this. But I would say, you know, also, in addition to everything that's good about setting goals that you mentioned, you know, if nothing else, um, having goals will allow you to see the obstacles in your way. It will allow you to see where you're coming up short. You know, it will allow you to see, well, maybe I don't have enough money to go and, you know, pay for magazine ads you know it's an assessment so, tool yeah right right so it helps you shape your plan if you if you do it correctly um so when you're working a project like say painkillers right you're at painkillers two three. right now it's three coming. okay three is coming Three's okay coming. um what is you know what is maybe a plan that you that you execute that you put into place to you know get that record out there and 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 get build up support for it um there are the, the short-term goals. My long-term goal for that entire project was to combine 
in the collective consciousness of people who were familiar with me as either a DJ or a producer to combine the two. Mm -hmm. um, because up until a certain point, I was operating as two separate beings, kind of. You know, there's DJ Payne, one the DJ, and DJ Payne, one the producer. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to marry the two. Um, and that's why I created Painkillers, because it was going to be a mixtape that I mixed so people knew I was an actual DJ, mm -hmm. not just someone who put DJ in front of his name, and a producer. Because a lot of people think I just do one or the other. Right, I've had right. people say, oh, oh, you're DJ Payne, the mixtape DJ, or the party <laughs> DJ, or whatever. I thought you were just the producer, or people at shows will come up to me, oh, you make beats? I'm like, yeah, I do, but I'm, not, I'm obviously <laughs> not doing something right. So... Right, right. That that was my idea. So that's my overarching goal, um, to to just strengthen the brand. Um, but as far as actually releasing it, my plan is to always have two um, exclusive original songs for the project because a lot of them are a collection of songs that that I've produced that I'm just bringing all together so that mm -hmm. people know all of these records are under the DJ Payne One production umbrella. Right. Um, so that's another goal. You know, because sometimes records get leaked and, and I don't get the right amount of credit, so I need to, to rebrand it all. But um, I always want to, so I got to find, I have to produce the, the, the correct beats and then, you know, be, you know, anal about all that. Mm -hmm. And then once that's done, get the right artists, the right, get the right combination of artists on it. So for Painkillers 2, it was the Love My City remix where I remixed um, the record that I did for Meek Mill. But I wanted artists from all different regions. So I got um, Mask, Money B, and Scott Knox. I got I-20. I got Rain. I got my artist David Yang. Range, who was, I believe, Rock Nation at the time on the hook and who actually sang the original hook. So that was that was that leak. And then I had another one, too. And it's slipping my mind right now. Um, then I needed a site to present it. And usually I go with um, DJ Booth because they've been a, a, a really supportive website and I know um, some of their staff personally so I've, I've built a really, they were actually one of the first websites or blogs that I've built a good relationship with um, other ones include you know Two Dope Boys, shout out to Shay, um, Kevin Nottingham, Hip Hop DX um, but as far as presenting a, a project my painkillers project I usually go with DJ Booth and um, then it's a matter of promoting. So mm -hmm. for this, for the next one, I'm actually gonna have because I because I had a meeting with with my best friend Memory, who also produced, the, and he, just to kind of create some type of strategy and pick his brain because you know your best friend knows you pretty well. So his thing was right. he wanted to personalize it. Right. So he created um, some videos where he just kind of like what we're doing right now, but a little right. more structured mm -hmm. and shorter. Uh, like a little trailer leading up to painkillers where I actually where you can see the process of me in the studio get some insight into what I'm talking about some just bringing the human element back into the release um, so I, I'm talking a whole lot but yeah basically I, I, I really have to plan the releases and then plan the date and stay consistent with the date right. put stuff on YouTube and space every, more importantly space everything out have a schedule this leak's going to drop here Get get all of the, the the publicists that I go through um, ready to, to, to drop that mixtape. Pray that all the sites that I that I want to um, support that tape that that record to support it. Then space it out. Drop the next one. Space it out. Drop the video trailer. And then okay, cool. Are people ready? Yeah, okay, this is the release date. You know the, the mixtape comes out then. And then in, do I invest money into? Um, you know, exclusivity with mm -hmm. that PIV or, you know, whatever the case is. And normally I do because it seems to work pretty well. Um, so then just promote on the social media, don't get annoying, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, talk to, sh to, to Mr. Get Your Buzz Up to do some more blog and website blast, that kind of thing. So it's a lot goes into a single mixtape. And I know I'm not doing as much as I could. And I see a lot of mixtapes that are otherwise very solid just mm -hmm. fall by the wayside because someone just picks a date two days later they have it up mm -hmm. three days later no one cares mm -hmm. 
let me ask you this, because um, you, you you dropped so many nuggets there. I, I want to kind of point out. I want I want to ask about individual pieces. So, you know, when you say you start out, you you choose one site. You say, all right, I'm going to start here and use that sort of as my hub or as my base. Um, do you have a particular approach to build up your rapport with those people before you ask for something, or is it, hey, you know, this is what I do. If you like it, let's work together. Um, not it's it's really. The thing with, with DJ Booth is that they had posted some of my music prior to me ever reaching out to them. Okay. And then years ago at the um, at the Get Your Buzz Up event out here, DJ Z from DJ Booth was one of the panelists. So I got to meet him face to face. And you know, there's, some, there's something about actually meeting somebody and, and shaking their hand and everything that really makes for a good relationship so now the fact that the the lines of communication were open with him I could say hey you know do you mind if I send you you some records I'm not gonna flood you but every like you know maybe twice a year can I send you some records right that you can consider for your site you know and he can either say yes or no but the fact that the lines of communication are open it, it means that I'll know and I have access to that person um, as far as other sites go, honestly, if I notice a site is posting my music, mm -hmm. I'm gonna contact them and thank them. I'm right. gonna, um, you know, ask them if they ever need help because some sites do. Like God Instrumentals, um, I met the owner of that in Miami way back, and I was like, "Yo, you know, I make beats, so it seems like a good, a, a good um, partnership at some point. So you know, whatever you need, let me know." Mm -hmm. So they needed me to host some some of the God Instrumentals tapes. They needed some exclusive beats. They needed me to um, mess with some drops. So I'm like, cool, I'm going to do all that. In exchange, if I have a project that needs to come out, an instrumental project, which you know I've had two so far, I plan on releasing a third one really soon, they're going to support me on that level. So it's just it's the barter system. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really what, what the independent music world is is thriving on right now, and a lot of people don't see it because it all happens behind closed doors. Right, exactly. You know, does a video like check out me and B from God Instrumental shaking hands right. and releasing this joint project? Like, nah, because no one cares about that. They care right. about the final result. But that's right. that's the type of stuff. That's that's where we come in. Right. You know, we want right. to demystify all that and and break the wall down and and clear all the smoke out and tear the mirrors down and say this is what it really is. And right. if you're not doing this, you're wasting your time because you're falling into the trap that everybody falls into. You look at the music videos and say, that's real life. That's reality. Right. It's not. And it's like it's 2003, and it's, it's crazy to me that people don't actually take the time to look beyond all of that. Right. I mean, it's interesting to me. It's amazing that, number one, I consider what we do right now, having a dialogue, and it's public, and it's live on you know Google+, Plus, the largest search engine in the world, you know, for someone who's looking for just free information, I would think people should be all over that. I would also think that more people like us would be doing songs like this and flooding Google Plus, right? Um, I caught a video that you did a while back, and you mentioned a list of sites, you know, Got Beats for, like all these other sites where people could go and they're actually looking for, be for beats. Yeah. So, you know, the knowledge and the information is there, but I think having someone that has the mind and the time and the, the, the hunger to put it all together and make a plan out of it, I think that what is what makes the difference. Um, I, I'll give you a chance to respond to that, and I've got another question for you. All I'll say is it's a, it's a job. I mean, if you want a music career, you got to treat it as a career. Most careers take a lot of work. People, people go to school from two to um, eight years just to have the the educational credentials to be in a certain career field right you know what I'm saying people put in hours until they get years at a, at a job before they get promoted why is rap treated differently but right, it is right. Right. I don't know why I think there's a lot of it uh, perception like you said I think the perception is what people buy into um, and I noticed that you know something we had talked about earlier as far as being able to build relationships with people I, I think a lot of artists so much of what a rapper artist is is based around their image, and if your image is that you know you're you're hardcore or you're too cool or you're just unapproachable, you know how do you as someone who's coming up trying to build and maintain that image for yourself, 
how do you go out and approach fans? How do you go out and approach people you might need to do business with? I mean, a lot of artists have a hardcore image that are extremely personable and are just happy to be supported and are humbled by all the support that they receive to the point where I would say Tech 9 is a good example. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he's been doing this for so long and this is all he does. Right. And it blows my mind just how devoted he is to his fans to the point where he could be on negative 10 hours of sleep and if that's even possible and he'd still do an interview he'd still sit in line for three hours to sign CDs he would still take photos with everybody high five everybody whatever um, and no one's gonna you know no one's sitting around like, oh you know Tech 9 is soft his image is, is uh, soft or whatever no he's a hardcore mm -hmm. rapper I, I don't know what kind of I, I wouldn't want to put him into a box but there are a lot of rappers out there like that. Um, ones that I've met that let me I'm trying to think. Um, to, like when I met Fifty Cent, it wasn't you know he's he's definitely a hardcore rapper and he has an image as you know a real harsh business person and and kind of made possibly unapproachable and he just came in, shook my hand, and we had a real quick chat, and that was it. So it, it was it was nothing like. He flinched at me and you know, <laughs> you know, threw me out a window or anything. Just, when, you're, when you're in the business, you got to treat it as a business, and, and right. your fans are not your adversaries, and your colleagues are not your adversaries. Right. Um, and you know, people conduct business differently. But if you want to be successful, you gotta, you, you gotta do your the outreach with fans. No fan wants wants their favorite artist to be an asshole. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, how involved are you with the with your local music scene and you know, how important do you feel like the local scenes are now with all this internet going around? You know, like, how, how, how much has it added to what you do and how much have you, do you feel any kind of responsibility to add to it? Oh. <laughs> um. I saved, I, saved, I saved the best for last, Payne. Yeah, yeah, no, that's <laughs> a question. Now, it's, 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 a, it's a crazy question because the local scene out here is just, I could go on for hours about it. I mean, we we can't have an event out here without the police showing up, mm -hmm. sending the gang unit out, or wow. the police not showing up and somebody showing up and shooting the spot up. I mean, it it literally happened five shows in a row to the point where this and you know this isn't a huge city, and it was just too many people shooting and getting shot. So they finally and fighting and doing whatever, and. Leading up to that, there there was a lot of it was like a self fulfilling prophecy because they were shutting down hip hop for oh, hip hop events over nothing, hmm. and then all of a sudden, you know everybody's walking on eggshells and all this bad stuff starts happening, and before that you're like, nah, you can't blame us, and then after right. a certain point you're like, okay, cool, they have a valid point, you know, rest in peace hip hop out here. <laughs> and that's how it's been. We haven't had anything. I mean, this this producer battle we have coming up on Saturday, which is at a community space. It's not a traditional hip hop event at a club. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I guess it's a traditional if you go way back because it's a it's a community event. Um, this is one of the first hip hop events in a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, but as far as that being a part of of where I am now, absolutely. I mean. I, you know, as a DJ, definitely, because you you can't really, in the hip-hop world, you really have to start at the street level mm -hmm. in the sense that if people don't know you in your own city and if you're not in the clubs and you're not putting mixtapes out with artists that you're familiar with, then you just can't grow, period. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one big part. Um, we, we do have a hip hop tradition out here. I think every scene's different. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't necessarily know. I mean, if you're in Atlanta, that's the cultural center of hip hop right now. It's also right. the commercial center of hip hop right now. Right. So if you're out there, yeah, definitely you want to um, network as much as you can locally. Can you can you skip over that and just go right to social media? Yeah, I think. 
you might be more ill prepared if you're not practicing and sharpening your blade locally and all of a sudden you're just out on the national scene a lot of the people in your city might not be cool with that and mm -hmm. you know it's, it's just kind of one of those credibility things but will that happen I don't know it, it's kind of it's it's up to everybody to, to decide for themselves um, but I'm, what was the last part of the question that was a, the last part of your question Maybe. Well, you, you, yeah, you pretty much answered it. But what I want to know is, did you feel any responsibility to, oh. you know, to, to to promote the local scene? And does the local scene matter? And I, 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 I you kind of answered that. But um, how active are you in the local scene? Um, I, as active as I can be, really. You know, I, I want to do events here. I don't want to travel, you know, eight hundred miles just to do an event. Right. Um. Is that always realistic? No. I mean, do I get fed up with people out here? Yeah, all the time. Do I get fed up with the scene out here? Do I get fed up with the police? Do I get fed up with the venue owners right. that act like cowards when something happens in their establishment? That's not my responsibility. Hell yes. But, <laughs> um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm from here. Right. So I'm always going to support the artists from here. That, And especially the artists that support me. You know, it, it to me, it's not a matter of feeling an obligation but it's a matter of that just being part of who I am right um so I, I don't feel obligated to support every artist out of my city if you're an asshole I don't want to support you you could be right. from down the street I don't I don't owe you anything right as a whole do I want to enrich the the um the the, the artist community out here yeah absolutely and so you know we're I'm, I'm a part of a nonprofit group that's that's doing just that um, the the B battle we have coming up is part of that. You know, we made it free for anyone under the age of 18 because we obviously want to usher in a new generation of of informed uh, hip hop artists, members of the the, the incoming hip hop generation. We want to educate members of all age groups um, from the artist scene. So we have last year we had a free event which was an industry conference. You know, and mm -hmm. because we're a nonprofit, we're not trying to make money off of any of this. So, uh, coming up in October, we have a really big one with some really big, you know, Grammy-nominated people, producers, marketers, um, industry figures coming in and holding workshops for professional development, artistry, business, that kind of thing, and that's going to be completely free. Cool. So, you know, when it, it's definitely, I think everyone feels a responsibility to their community, and if maybe responsibility is not the right word, maybe connection. You know, it's like family. Like, there are certain family members you might not talk to for five years because they piss you off somehow, but that person is still family. So that's kind of how I feel with, with um, what's, cool. what's happening in my city. Cool. I want to switch gears before we end. I, I've got to wrap up. But I want to know from the production side of things, um, what are some of your tools of the trade, you know, that are your favorites that you use when you make, you know, your hits? Uh, Nexus. Okay. I don't How's have that? a new version, but I have the old version. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm not going to ask you what your secret weapon is, but but if you would... I don't have a it... secret weapon. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew, but I don't have a secret weapon. Is well, 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 let me ask you this, because, I, you know, like I said, I, I hear your beats, and I know that you sort of, you know, the flavor that you provide may be a little bit different from what might be some of the industry standard right now. And I oh. want to know is, if you're talking to an up-and-coming producer, what would you say they should practice or work on, you know, in their craft to give their, their sound a little something extra, you know? See, that's kind of an X factor that's hard to teach, you know, because if you want to stand out, that's one thing, but then learning the essentials is another thing, and I think people learn by example. Mm -hmm. So, I, I wouldn't say it's a bad thing to listen to music that you enjoy and try to just learn those techniques. I think that's what everybody did. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they heard a song they liked and they thought, how did they get their drums like that? Right. And they practiced and they figured it out. And then they added in their own interpretation of, of what they wanted to do musically. And then that became their style. So, I hope I'm doing that. I mean, you said my stuff stands out a little so that's that's a good thing um, I don't know um, 
music is just so subjective. It's it's hard for me to. It, I mean, if your mix sounds horrible, right. then your mix sounds horrible. That's you can't really win off that. But it's a lot of different stuff out there, and and now more than ever, the weirder the better it seems. Mm -hmm. So if you can stand out and add a unique edge to something or a variation of a popular theme, I'm all for it. Combine genres, um, use some weird effects. I don't know. Just just do whatever you feel you enjoy, because a lot of people are doing that, and, and you know, it's I, we for them. We've seen um, sort of the, the dubstep thing come in and sort of it burned real hot and then it burned out. And now, you know, EDM and disco are kind of taking things over from, I would say, a hip hop producer's perspective. And I don't want to put you in a box, but, you know, from someone who produces hip hop, do you feel any sort of pressure or, or influence to, you know, maybe go in that direction with your sound at all? I would never go in a direction of any genre of music. If I didn't feel um, a cultural connection to that music or a personal connection to that music, and I think a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon, not just producers but rappers too, because they saw that the EDM stuff was hot, so they figured, you know, I better do that because then if I do that, I'll be hot too. But you got to understand, every music comes with a set of cultural principles. Mm -hmm. so hip hop more than anything, so we as hip hoppers should be acutely aware of that. I can't just jump into EDM because that's not something that I grew up listening to. It's not something that I feel a cultural affinity towards. And that's to say nothing negative about EDM. It's just that I wasn't I wasn't at EDM events. You know what I'm saying? I was at hip hop events. So culturally, I'm always going to be hip hop. Um, when I listen to some of the EDM music, I think, yo, that you know, something music, some musical element in the song is crazy. Let me try to incorporate that into what I'm already doing. But I don't want to just change in the ninth inning, you know, and just say all this hip hop stuff that I've been doing for the past 10, 15 years, forget it. Hmm. I'm doing exactly what, because Diplo's hot right now. I'm just gonna just copy everything he's doing. Um, I, I would never do that. I just gotta kind of stick with with what I know. But if a new type of music came along that represented me and I felt personally connected to it, I think my style would definitely evolve in that direction. So it just goes back to people being true to themselves. And mm -hmm. as corny as that sounds, it, it you really got to be connected to the music that you make. Otherwise, it's going to be insincere and you're not really going to fully um, create it to the best of your ability because you're not devoted to it. You're just... It's the flavor of the moment that you're trying to jump on before it disappears. And by the time something's big, it's already on its way out. Right, right, absolutely. And, you know, as someone who, you know, you, you keep your ear to the ground, and I know you do your research. Um, so when you say that, then, you know, I, I think people can trust that, you know, it's, it, it's, it's something that's truthful. Um, so we're going to wrap up. Uh, I wanted to get, you know, we, we didn't get as much of your, your, your direct advice, you know, to the, to the artists as we did in the uh, other interview. But what I want to know is going forward, um, do you have any plans for maybe putting some of your lessons and tips together and packaging them? Or, you know, it, it, where, where should people go next? What should we look for, for from you next? Um, <laughs> ho hopefully way bigger records. Hopefully, some actual hit records. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue with the, the the tips. I mean, I'm I'm growing and learning. So the more I grow and learn, the more equipped I'll be to share that information. So the more the more I get, the more I'll give. Um, so that's not gonna stop. I mean, like I said, I go on tour next week. So hopefully, I learn a bunch of new stuff. I always do. Mm -hmm. Meet some new people. Gain some new insight. Um, and just just keep moving forward. I think any day involving any degree of progress, a millimeter, a centimeter, whatever, is a good day. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, tell us what you know. You're going on tour. What's out right now that people should go and check out from you? Yeah, um, yeah. download the brand new i20 Amphetamine Manifesto 2. It just came out on Tuesday. So as of today, we have. What I think seven thousand downloads. 
So that's like a day and a half. What today's third? Yeah, a day and a half. Um, check that out. It's on that Piff. It's on live mixtapes. You check me out on Twitter at DJ Pain when I'm retweeting everything. Um, cool. so a lot of support on that. Watch out for Painkillers three. Watch out for Undress Instrumentals three. If you want copies of Painkillers one and two and Undress and Instrumentals one and two, check out DJ Pain one dot info on the internet. It's all out there. Um, my YouTube videos are on that site as well. So any of the series that they appeal to you, check those out. Cool, cool. And we'll put that stuff in once we edit the showdown. Uh, before we leave, I've got one question from J Dig Beats on Twitter. And he wants to know, uh, what was your favorite artist to work with and why? Who was your favorite artist to work with? Um, man. It, it's all, uh, it's all, it's like a case by case basis because I like working with different artists for different reasons. Like I really like working with Rain back when we were putting a lot of music out because I feel like we had the same sensibilities even though he rapped and I produced. Um, I would say, from a fan's perspective, the coolest, yeah, Public Enemy. That oh, was wow, okay. I'm, I've been a huge Public Enemy fan since the '90s. And I was kind of late. I was late on that. Like I didn't start listening until I was in elementary school. But like you know, later on, it was actually a teacher, my fifth grade teacher, who got me into Public Enemy. Um, but you know, twelve years later, I get to work with. No, it was longer than that. Many years later, I get to work with Chuck D, and then that ended up. Um, turning into me producing a track on their last two official releases. I mean, I had Flavor Flav on one of my beats. Wow. So it was just and, and we got more in the works. And I wish I could tell you about the one we got in the works because it's. I, I can't. I, I don't use this word lightly, but it's it's definitely legendary. Wow. So it's just really cool to all of a sudden be a part of the musical history in whatever capacity. I, you right. know, I, I'm just humbled to be a speck in the overall lifeblood of hip hop culture by, you know, being a part of these two projects and being a part of the, the projects in the future, just as a fan of the culture, you know what I mean? Well, I'll say this because I'm a huge Public Enemy fan and, and you know, I think they just got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame yeah. uh, this year. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, for you to be able to say your name in connection with Public Enemy and, and and to boast that you've got a groundbreaking, you know, hit with them in the works. You know, that's big stuff, man. So, you know, definitely good luck with that and, and you know, keep us posted. You know, I want to hear more about it and I uh, can't wait for that to come out. So, Me neither. You know, <laughs> th uh, thanks again, man, for, for coming and taking the chance, you know, taking the time to talk with us. Um, you know, it was enlightening. Uh, and, you know, like I said, hopefully... Uh, big things will, will continue to happen for you. Um, do you have any uh, feedback uh, for me and from us and, and our show format and you know what we're trying to do here? Uh, I like it. How can we improve? <laughs> oh man, that's not my specialty. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Um, we'll post this up and uh, like I said, we'll get back in touch with you and uh, let you know when it comes out. Sounds good. I appreciate it. DJ Payne one. Thanks a lot. Uh, Thank you. All right. Till next time. Till next time.